And finally, uh, let me just uh, introduce Monty. And um, you know, again, we're we're talking on the. F he's going to be talking about uh, keeping the focus of ed talk ed tech on pedagogy. Uh, too often, we uh, deploy education technology for the purpose of education technology, but uh, he is going to be talking about integrating student learning and collaborative technology at Fried Hardeman University. Uh, there's information about Monty here, but uh, let me bring him up to the stage. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Doing great. Okay. Yeah, well, welcome to EdChat Interactive. And um, just so you, your semester has started, right? So what course, what are you teaching? Well, I'm currently teaching uh, EDU 642 Advanced Technology for Educators. Plus, I'm in mm -hmm. the process of building a brand new online master's in instructional technology for Fried Hardeman that will begin summer of 17. Now, the master's program, could somebody sign up from anywhere? I mean, they don't have to be it's, where you are, right? It's going to be totally online, so they can be in Australia, they can be in New Zealand, they can be in France, wherever they are. They will never have to physically come on campus. Wow. Well, that should be a great program. What, what, I, I guess maybe just talk, what's, what's a highlight? You know, one of the things that you're most excited about with the program? Well, one of the exciting things is that five of the courses we're build, building in prior learning experience, and they will have the ability to basically look at the rubric for that particular course and then bring in their evidences and then, in essence, have a mini uh, oral defense as to why they feel like their evidences meet the rubric and they should get credit for the course based on their evidence. Wow, so that just seems to me that that's the way schools should work. Oh yes. Um, and, to, and, and they don't yet, so that's, wow, that's great, that's great. So, uh, you know, I know that you, uh, I, I, I've, I've seen your slides, there's, there's a lot of information that, that you want to cover tonight, so why don't I pull myself down and, and pull your slides up? Sounds great. Okay. And, and I do want to let the participants know that I have been looking at the registration. I've been looking at the questions that several of you said that you would like for me to cover. And I will tell you that I probably will not cover every question within this presentation. But please do not hesitate to contact me either via email and I'll, I'll also be giving you my Google Voice number toward the end of the presentation. But over the last five years, Fried Hardeman University has been involved in a I Learn program, which was part of our quality enhancement plan, which we were integrating technology within our gen ed classes. And like the title of this presentation says, Keeping the Focus of Tech on Pedagogy, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that we did and some of the what to watch out for. Now the next slide basically just sort of gives you information about who I am. I've been at this thing we call education since 1979 is when I started teaching and then I've been involved in this what we call educational technology since 1983. And so we'll go ahead and go on to the next slide. And these uh, four bullets basically tell you what we were covering with the um, iLearn program. We were refocusing on the pedagogical aspects of integrating technology into the teaching and learning process. So often, whether it be K-12 or higher ed, your tech initiatives are ran more by your information technology department rather than academics and what we were trying to do with this program is make sure that it had more of an academic emphasis versus an information technology emphasis. We were also wanting to maximize the impact that iLearn had on student learning in selected general education classes. iLearn faculty once they were selected examined their own pedagogy as it related to their specific student learning outcomes. We had um, teachers that were teaching biology, chemistry, um, algebra one, 
uh, math fundamentals, speech communication, English Comp 2, uh, theater, uh, art appreciation, music appreciation, psychology, and sociology. So those were our gen ed classes that were involved in the process. And then they were presented with a variety of technology-based pedagogical methods from which they could choose. Next slide. And part of um, what we did is we divided them into cohorts. So our math and science were in cohort one. Our um, cohort two was our speech communication and our uh, Eng English Comp 2 teachers. And then finally, cohort three was theater, uh, art appreciation, music appreciation, sociology, and psychology. And then once they picked what they wanted to use, when their cohort came up, they then started integrating those uh, technologies in their courses. And then assessment data for the student learning outcomes was collected and analyzed to determine the impact of selected methods. And then each semester, if they needed to make revisions, they would make revisions. Next slide. Now, part of what we see is that we had th three goals with the program. Goal one was to improve student learning in the iLearn general education courses by integrating pedagogical technologies to engage student learners. And the key term in goal one was engage. Goal two, to enhance faculty teaching in iLearn general education courses through the use of collaborative pedagogical technologies. And the key in that goal was collaborative. We wanted them to choose pedagogical technologies that would cause the students to become engaged in the learning process. And then finally, goal three was to provide additional resources in order to maximize the impact of the iLearn program. And some of those additional resources, when we started at, we ended May of last year. So we wrote the uh, quality enhancement plan six years ago, and then we began the process five years ago. Many of our classrooms on the campus weren't really set up to truly integrate technology. So part of what the iLearn program did, not only for the classrooms that were going to be used for the iLearn teachers, but we also, after getting those set up, we had monies that we could then go to other classrooms and do the same thing. We made sure that they had an LCD projector, Apple TV connected to the LCD projector. Those classes that were part of the iLearn program even had a Yeti mic hanging from the ceiling that they were able to record what was taking place in the classroom along with a webcam in the corner of the classroom to capture what the students were doing. We also set up uh, some sound rooms for the professors to uh, do some flipping of their classrooms. We also had a training room that we built to be able to bring them in to train them on the pedagogical technologies. In our library, we set forth a learning commons for the students where they had an area to come together to work on collaborative projects. They had uh, TV screens that they could connect their devices to. Plus, we had some student workers there that were able to assist them in any projects that the faculty assigned to them that they weren't quite sure how to utilize the technology. Next slide, please. Now, part of the frustration is that prior to the iLearn program beginning, information technology along with the president began an I Know initiative where they were rolling out technology. 2010-11 and 2011-12, the incoming freshmen received their a MacBook and their choice of an iPhone or an iPod. So, the year that the cohort one was training, they were actually training on how to implement technologies with the MacBook. So sort of remember cohort one and the aspect of the MacBook. Cohort two, when they started training, 
they also had the MacBook, but at the end of Cohort 2's training year, the university decided to switch to iPads. So Cohort 2 sort of got a mix of their training. They got a training on the MacBook and on iPads, and the summer between Cohort 2 and Cohort 3, the entire faculty, we learned a lesson from the rollout of MacBooks. The faculty received it over a four-year cycle. So you had students with MacBooks that sometimes their teacher didn't have a MacBook. Then with the iPad, every faculty person had an iPad and was trained on how to use that in the classroom, but then it was just the incoming freshmen receiving the iPad. So part of our frustration there was the fact that the device didn't always match the training that they were receiving on how to bring it into the classroom. So that brings us to our first question that I want us to break out and think about. So go ahead and bring that question up. What's the importance of training and equipment in a tech initiative? So I want to pause for about a couple of minutes and let you get together in groups of two or three and talk about that question and then as you're talking I may come in and pop in to some of the uh, groups and listen to what you have to say but as you're thinking of that think of that question in your setting if your elementary setting think about it within your elementary setting if you're middle school high school and if you happen to be in here and you're on higher ed Talk about it from a higher ed perspective, okay? I'm going to stop talking and let y'all get together and talk. So you have the bad luck of uh, Monty uh, coming down and stop talking, and now you have to listen to me. But I'm going to be very quick. I'm just going to say this is a, this is one of the times to interact. And uh, Monty told you about a case where the equipment wasn't what people were training in. And uh, you should click on the avatar of another person um, and discuss with that other person or those people the importance of training and equipment in a tech initiative. Um, I'll say that if you don't have a webcam, uh, go ahead and type it into the chat window. Hopefully you all have the uh, chat windows open. If you don't, just uh, put your cursor over your avatar. Hey, Steve. I am there. Click on I am and start uh, typing. So how are you doing this evening? Um, some of your comments about the importance. Good. I'll bring myself Good. down. So what did uh, bring Monty back up? Eaton, uh, Harlem. So what, what grade teach. level do you teach? I literally teach some some years from pre-K through eighth grade. Bless your heart. <laughs> and it, I teach in two separate computer labs. Um, we do coding, robotics, uh, digital citizenship, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, but it's a struggle keeping everything running well. We're kind of at the end of a tech cycle right now. And it's been very difficult keeping things in good shape and making sure my teachers have access to technology in class. Well, now, now, did you have the same struggles that I had that so often you're trained on one device and all of a sudden you bring in another device? Absolutely. In, in fact, um, I've had so many separate funding sources that there's really no consistency across. My school will have five different generations of interactive whiteboards. Um, I have now middle schoolers on Chromebooks and primary students on iOS devices. It makes management a bear. It really does. I can imagine. Well, I'm going to go I ahead. I still wouldn't want to go to secondary. No, no. <laughs> I'm going to separate myself and go into a couple of more chats. Alrighty. Thanks, Monty. Okay, so I saw you had a chance to interact with a couple of the people also. Yes. So what you know, how do people respond? The person that I was talking to had the same frustration that I've had over the last five years oh, now, and that um, I just seem to you just seem to have locked so I'm gonna stop the broadcast and I'm gonna bring back up and see if and, and see if you come back up
Okay, are you? Okay, am I Go am ahead, I here? Marty. Am I here? Yep, you're back. Yep, you're back. You're okay. back there. Okay. As I was saying, this individual uh, works in a pre-K through eighth grade setting, and some of his teachers are dealing with uh, Chrome devices. Some are dealing with iOS devices. Some are dealing with other devices. And so, from an aspect of trying to give them assistance on truly integrating that technology, it can get frustrating. And so right. what we've got to remember when we're dealing with keeping the pedagogy in focus is that if at all possible, the teachers in the building need to all be interacting with the same device. That's why with even even K-12 and higher ed, so many people are talking about bring your own device. Well, that's when you almost mm -hmm. have to think, okay, should I think of web-based aspects of technology rather than device-specific? Or think of mm -hmm. apps that are agnostic to devices and can be used on any device. So those are questions and things that we have to think about as we realize that our emphasis needs to be on the pedagogy. Now, I see um, Julia Cole is attending this, but she, I think she's attending on a uh, tablet, so she can't, uh, she can't interact that way. But she's, you know, what she brought up is that the importance is to stay updated with, with 21st century uh, I guess a 21st century skills and 21st century tools, right? Right. And, and so do you want, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, and then the other thing is Marissa just asked a question. Uh, do your students purchase their own devices or do you provide them? What we did with the I Know initiative, the incoming freshmen were receiving the device, but in essence, it was put on their bill over like a four year period. So those that received the MacBooks, it became their MacBook, but they didn't mm -hmm. have to pay for it up front. They paid for it over a four year cycle. And if they happened to leave Fried Hardeman, then they went ahead and paid for it and the device was theirs. The iPad, mm -hmm. since it's much cheaper, it actually was put on their bill the very first year they were a freshman. So they received it, mm -hmm. but they in essence paid for it. Okay. And it's different also because you're a university and you know some of the people attending tonight are in you know, you know either high schools, middle schools or elementary schools and just it's it's right. different. But and it's going to be different at every school anyhow. Right. And I have to say, when I was a middle school principal and we started using the technologies that were available at that time, what I did as a middle school principal is I got with uh, my uh, parent-teacher organization and got with uh, other companies that interacted with the school to get funding to bring in the technologies that we needed for the school. And even um, I was in the middle school uh, from 1999 to 2004. And when we built our brand new middle school in 2002, I made sure that we opened that building with every teacher with an LCD projector and a teacher computer and three student computers. So when we wow. opened the door, every teacher had that to begin with. And then each year, the next year, I had three seventh grade teams, three sixth grade teams, three eighth grade teams. I started out with a rolling cart of 30 laptops that they rotated each day among the teams. Then I was able to get monies the next year to bring in two 15 station rolling carts. So they traded those rolling carts around, but that was back during the time of that technology. Right, right. And well, you know, I'm thinking, I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking, you know, maybe I should pull myself down and bring your slides up. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And I will say, even if we don't get through all the slides, the information that we're talking about is very important. 
And the thing that we've got to remember about bringing the focus on pedagogy is that no matter whether I'm in an elementary setting, middle school setting, high school setting, higher ed setting, I've got to make sure that the technology is no different than a pen or a pencil. I didn't think about how am I going to use the pen, I used the pen. I didn't think about how am I going to use the pencil, I used the pencil. Technology as a tool should be a resource. It should not be what we put the focus on. With the quantitative data, what we did, next slide please, we went ahead and looked at the assessment data that the iLearn courses were using already. So over the five year period, before they started integrating, we took um, the test results so that we would have some baseline information. Then assessment data was generated from the embedded assessments and then the faculty coded the individual student performance either as exceeds, meets, or does not meet. And then the metric used in the analysis of the iLearn program was the proportion of students in each competency who either met or exceeded expectations. Next slide, please. Now, as you can see, there were three conclusions that we drew from this data. Number one, the assessment data generated from the iLearn courses shows considerable variability over the duration of the study. Number two, there's no obvious pattern or explanation for the variability in the data. And number three, for a good number of the individual learning outcomes, the data shows no significant increase or decrease in the percentage of students meeting or exceeding expectations for learning. Now, those of you that are sitting in the audience from a K-12 perspective, you're probably thinking, we're very familiar with this. Because what happens is when you try to compare different students each year, quantitative data really is not going to give you the information that you need because you're not dealing with the same students each year. And for higher ed, not only is it on a year basis, but it's a semester basis because you take a class for a semester and you don't necessarily have the same class the next semester. Sometimes it's two semesters and sometimes it's one semester. And so that sort of puts even more um, I can't think of the word I'm looking for right now. But go ahead and go to the next slide. Maybe that'll help me think of the next word. As we looked at the qualitative data, next slide, we got a little richer information with the qualitative data because what I was able to do with the qualitative data, every semester I met with focus groups from all of the classes that were taking part. So in 2012, I had the math and science. So I met with the math and science students and went through a series of questions and those questions were based on student experience, communication, faculty innovation, and technology experience. And overall, the students expressed higher levels of success and satisfaction when technology was used to engage them in the active learning process rather than being passive participants. It's just like in this shindig that we're having. When I'm doing all the talking, that's passive. But then when you're able to break off and start interacting with each other, that gives you the ability to start thinking a little bit about what's taking place. So as these iLearn teachers used, learned about various collaborative technologies to be able to get their students together in groups and take ownership of what they were learning, it caused the learning to grow and to have an interest. Next slide, please. So the first thing we looked at was student experience. And we looked at the question either from the aspect of, was it a success aspect or a satisfaction? And within the student experience, 
The students benefited from faculty using screen capture and an annotation tools which assisted students in preparing for exams. So that led to success. Students' collabor collaboration experience was expedited and enhanced with cloud storage tools. Thirdly, students in several of the classes had positive collaboration experience with a program that FHU wrote in their information technology department called Contribute. And there were several of us that had input on Contribute, and Contribute was sort of a mixture of Facebook, Twitter, and I use a social networking tool called Plurk, which allows you to see what the students say underneath a question thread. So instead of having to follow a hashtag or anything like that, it's right underneath that question. Well, Information Technology built all these pieces inside our program called Contribute, so the teachers would, were able to actually have that going sort of as a sidebar in their class. So whether they were looking at a project or listening to a presentation or even the teacher presenting. They would have a sidebar going along and contribute that ever so often the teacher would stop and say, okay, let's look at the discussion that's going on here. And that would bring the learning full circle. And then we have the students benefited from the publisher created online resources, which assisted the students in preparing for quizzes and exams. Next slide. That brings us to brings us to the next question I want you to talk about. What software technologies do your teachers and students use and what has been their experience? Now as we're going to see just from the last question, at each level it's going to be a little different and sometimes that's why I'm leaning more and more toward device agnostic tools or Web, div, div, web device agnostic tools so that we don't have to think about is it a PC, a MacBook, is it an Android, is it an iOS device, but talk about those technologies and some of the things that are taking place and I'm going to come in on a couple of those conversations. So again, uh, this is the time where you, uh, you become active instead of passive. Uh, you click on the avatar of another person and uh, talk to each other about what software technologies your teachers and students use, what have been their experiences, how does it compare when everybody's using the same thing versus when different people are using uh, different technologies or platforms. So I'll bring oh, this Todd. down also. I see some of you are already talking. Uh, you can use the IM. How are you doing? Also and or if you uh, if you click on ask and you type something to me I'll uh, publish it so that, so that everybody can see it. Hey Kimberly are you there? Kimberly are you there? Kimberly Hey ladies. So even from this old round. Hey. <laughs> so are y'all learning anything this evening? Yeah, me and Howard just talking that we're not working in the school system yet. So we haven't experienced really um, technologies being utilized in the classroom because we hadn't got into that yet. Well, but so. one thing you will find as you get into it, sometimes it gets frustrating especially if the elementary grades, if first, second, and third grade uses one thing and then fourth and fifth grade uses something else, that's why you have to sort of think through this whole process and keep pedagogy in mind versus the tool. Yes, sir. So, well, I will break off and talk to a couple of more groups and then I'll go back up to the stage in a moment. Okay.
Okay, well, I see that there are still some conversations going, but I'll bring Monty back up. Monty, do you want to ask um, for a volunteer to come up on stage, and do you want to talk with them what they talked about, or do you have, do you want to summarize the uh, conversation that you had? Yeah, let, let's do that. Uh, let's let uh, see if anyone raises their hand and wants to come up, or if uh, they want me just to choose someone. Does anyone want to uh, raise their hand? Right, so raise hand means that there's that hand avatar underneath your, or hand icon underneath your avatar. Click on that if you want to come up on stage. If you don't, then uh, maybe Monty will choose somebody and we'll bring that person up. Okay, I'm going to... I don't gonna... see any raise, nobody's okay. raising hands right now. Okay, I know she's a little on the shy side, but I'm going to uh, call on Laura to come up. And she's probably okay, thinking... So... Why did you pick me? Okay, so now I have to find a Laura here. Um, oh, there she is. Okay, so I'm going to up up Laura. Hello, Laura. Hi. What what, what was your group talking hey. about? Hey, yeah. Um, mostly just about different technology, like you know, with um, grades through K through twelve and what that has to deal with. Okay, now let me ask you but, a question. Um, you you did your training at Fried Hardeman, right? Did you do your undergraduate uh, at Fried Hardeman? In, yeah, I started in 2011. That's when they still did the MacBooks, and then I graduated in December 15th. So. And I think they switched to iPads now. Right. So what right. was your experience with receiving the MacBook and then the different teachers doing different things in the classroom, did the technology seem to help or not? Um, I think it really, you know, seemed to help, which, you know, mostly everybody did their notes on there. And um, even like a Microsoft Word, you can record the teacher, like if you want to, you know, play it again to make sure you didn't miss anything in class. But I think it was really good. I kind of wish that they'd still do, you know, the MacBook Pros instead of, just like the iPads, which you can still buy a computer, but I just, I don't know, I kind of preferred the other way better. Okay. Well, you're going to find out some uh, information we discovered in the study that uh, is going to sort of uh, enhance what you just said. All right. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. You appreciate it. All right, so he's bringing up the slides, and the next thing that we looked at in the student focus groups was on communication. And there were a few things that we found in communication. One was that the students were dissatisfied with the fact that the faculty's main mode of communication was through email. The faculty stuck with what they were familiar with. We were having students coming in that were getting more connected to social networking and was sort of hoping that the faculty would embrace the social networking tools, but they still stuck with the old-fashioned email. Now, students were satisfied with communicating and collaborating with each other because they could use the social networking tools. And then the theater students especially were highly satisfied because their instructor embraced social networking by creating a Facebook group that his classes were a part of that he communicated with his students. And many times what this theater teacher would do is keep that Facebook group going. And as those students came into the theater program, he was able to continue to communicate with them through that Facebook group. Now, the next thing we looked at was faculty innovation. Now, the faculty innovation we broke down according to the various type of programs. The chemistry students really liked the fact that their professor did the flipping of the class that really helped them in preparing for exams. The music students, their music teacher created his own iBook. 
that was their book for the course. So he brought in interactive videos, interactive podcasts, uh, music that he wrote himself, uh, recordings that he did himself that were all part of this iBook that then brought the experience to life. And so it allowed them to really see the relevancy between what they were learning and what was taking place. The theater students enjoyed using their devices regardless of what device they had, whether it was an Android, iOS device, tablet, whatever. They videoed all their performances each week journaled about that process using either Google Docs or whatever they chose and it really allowed them to visualize their growth and then finally the biology students used the mobile technology to create video projects that enabled them to engage in active learning and developed a new perspective on and greater appreciation for the class topics. I was always invited each semester to come into that class and to watch those presentations. And what they would do is they would be given a topic, whether it be the um, dirty water that's in several of the third world countries and what would they do to clean that up or the bacteria problem they were having in different places and so that group would create a video talking about the ideas of how to uh, take care of that pro pro problem as well as creating a Facebook page that people could donate monies to help with that particular project and so they really were able to get connected through the technology within these various classes. And that leads me to the next question that I want you to think about is what have been some of your faculty innovations within your setting? And I know there's two or three students out there that are not in a K-12 setting, but thinking of even in your setting, what are ways in which uh, people have been innovative and how has that made an impact, whether it be an impact on the clients that your uh, company works with or the students if you're in a K-12 setting. So talk about that question a little bit. Okay, interaction number three. Uh, you know the drill. I'm going to pull myself down, and uh, Mont Monty and I will come up in a few minutes. Oh, and please, somebody, this time, when Monty asks for a volunteer, click on the raise hand button. We won't bite. Promise. <laughs> Hey, Tanil, are you there? Hey, Marissa. Hello. How are you doing, Marissa? I'm good. What setting are you in? I'm at Abilene Christian University. Oh, okay, Abilene Christian. Well, gl glad to have you. So, uh, and I had the opportunity to actually come to Abilene a few years ago and uh, make a report on our iPad initiative that we had several years ago. And so what all is taking place at uh, Abilene? Uh -huh. What are some things taking place at Abilene? Well, we're reevaluating that initiative. We're we're reevaluating the iPad at Abilene, and so, uh, seeing so, where we should be with our students. Now, are you are you finding sort of the same I, thing? One that, question I have for you is, how did you get all the faculty to participate like that? Uh, the summer that we gave them the iPad training. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? 
Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm having a hard time hearing you, but um, what we're struggling with is... Go ahead. Okay, the way in which we got them connected in the training was through was through offering um, iTunes cards. So every teacher got fifty dollars in iTunes cards at the end of the training to get apps that they would use with their uh, uh, students. Hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Well, it looks like there were some discussions there. Um, Debbie Wiles is on and she raised her hand, but unfortunately she's on a tablet, so I can't really communicate with her. Um, so uh, Debbie, if you have a question, uh, put it into the question, or if you have a comment, put it into, into the question field and I'll relay it out. But uh, so Monty, do you want to ask for a volunteer or do you want to just summarize what you talked about or what, what would you like to do? Uh, let me summarize a little bit about what uh, the group uh, was talking about. Um, the question was asked, what did we do at Fried Hardeman to encourage the faculty to embrace the uh, using technologies, whatever the technologies may be? And we learned a lesson with the rollout of the MacBook. The MacBook came out in a four-year cycle. 25% of the faculty, 25% of the faculty, 25% of the faculty. And we realized you can't really be effective with any kind of technology if you break the receiving of the technology in that way. So with the iPad, we decided we got to get the iPad in the hand of every professor at least six months prior to expecting them to use it in the classroom. So we purchased the iPads, we got them in the hands of the professors, let them play with it a little bit, and then we started a 10-hour training where eight of the hours were in groups and two, two of the hours were one-on-one. -on -one. So there were five of us that worked with the one-on-one -on -one training, which kept mm -hmm. us busy, but we got it done before the fall began. and we had sort of a carrot. They got a $50 iTunes card at the end of their training to purchase apps that they would then use with the students. And so that allowed us to get them connected. Now I will say, I don't care whether it's a K-12 or higher ed, you're always going to have some teachers that are a little reluctant. And what I've always told people, it comes to modeling your expectations. When I was a principal at the middle school I was talking about a few minutes ago, I would stand at the door with my PDA as they came in, expecting them to beam to me whatever I wanted. I did not take it in paper and pencil. It either had to be beamed to my PDA or it had to be waiting for me in my email. And if they gave it to me in paper and pencil, it affected their yearly evaluation. But mm -hmm. professional developments were the same way. I modeled in the professional development how to utilize the technology and how to be interactive with the technology. So the key is that you model how to focus on pedagogy with the technology, whether it be elementary, middle, high, or higher ed. I, I truly so believe that's the key. So why don't we go so, on uh, to the, go ahead. Okay, just one thing, just that uh, Debbie Wiles um, did, did comment and she said that one of the, um, you know, something that was very effective for her was, a, was a Seesaw, which is an online digital portfolio which enabled uh, second grade students to document their learning and that learning could then be used by the teachers. It could be used by her as a supervisor, and it could also be used by the parents. It's kind of like a Facebook. 
and uh, that was really you know she she said that that was really successful. Great. So uh, that's you know I, and I think that's a really good example of a technology which was introduced very successfully. Fantastic. So I'll bring myself. Yeah, I'll bring myself down and uh, get your slides back up. Okay, thank you. And Debbie, thank you for uh, uh, sharing that. And so that then leaves us with the technology experience. And as you can see with the technology experience, we have differing views on the technology. 100% of the students who received a MacBook stated that they had a better learning experience with the MacBook than they did with a smartphone or a tablet. 90% of the students who received an iPad stated they never used their iPad for classwork, hence they either brought a PC or a MacBook. Now unfortunately, a few of our students could not afford a MacBook or a PC. Now I will have to say I did 85% of my work on my iPad. So I worked with those students that could not afford a PC or a MacBook use some of the iLearned monies to help them get the apps on their devices that could then allow them to interact with their iPad much like you would a uh, um, computer and we helped them get a keyboard as well because with a tablet many times having a keyboard allows a tablet to be a little more effective. 100% of the students who received the iPad said they used it mainly for the personal use, the email, the social networking, the games, the videos, etc. Now, both groups, whether they were a group that received a MacBook or a group that received the iPad, what they emphasized was that whether it's a MacBook or an iPad, they felt like the university should ha always have some type of program in place for families who cannot afford a laptop. Because even if Fried Hardman decides to go with the BYOD, you're going to have some students that still cannot afford the device. So they're, I think, leaning toward the student would still have the option of having that device put on their bill over a four-year cycle and be able to pay it off during a four-year cycle. Now I will also say that uh, many of the students also emphasized that they were able to be more productive with a MacBook when it came to the interactivity of the projects they were doing versus a PC. A PC they would sometimes have to use three or four different third-party things to get done with what you could do with GarageBand or iMovie with the MacBook. Next slide, please. Now, I'm noticing our time. Our time is 7.56. I'm going to skip question four for a minute, and I want to talk very quickly about the last uh, section. Uh, over the course of the study, the iLearn faculty selected 28 pedagogical technologies that range from device-dependent productivity tools to web-based collaborative tools. Next slide, please. Now, we did the training based on these categories. Some of them were productivity tools. Some of them dealt with our LMS, which in our place is Blackboard Learn. Some dealt with content consumption, content creation, and collaboration. And of the 14 teachers that were left in the uh, study, you can see that they all interacted with the different type, but they really made sure that they truly were utilizing the content consumption and the content creation. Now up there at the top, you can see that there were four iLearn faculty that used their chosen technology on a daily basis, nine on a weekly basis, and unfortunately one on a monthly basis. And uh, so a lot of times it just depended upon whether that technology was a technology that was a technology they were using versus a technology that the students were using. 
and the teachers that were I had a, a math teacher oh, both of my math teachers used uh, explain everything on their uh, iPad and so as they were going through the process of teaching the math it was recording what they were doing on the iPad so they could then put that recording up on Blackboard for the student to go back and look at again as they were doing their homework and getting ready for quizzes and exams. And it was not quite flipping the class, but at the same time, it allowed the students to go back and revisit the material. And then the chemistry teacher would record the mini lectures ahead of time, but also during class, he would record what was taking place during class. And so if he was going over uh, chemistry equations, those te uh, students were able to go back and look at those chemistry equations equations and the project type um, that the students did on a weekly basis was much like the nine that would have the students work on weekly projects and so those are things that we did throughout the five-year cycle go on to the next slide please Mitch The last question is, what pedagogical technologies do your teachers use and what were the students' experience? I know we don't have time for you to th uh, break out, but I want you to think about that it's question as well. And let's go on to the next slide. These are some of the long-term impacts that we have learned from our uh, iLearn program. Our Center for Instructional Technology morphed from focusing on the technology to becoming a Center for Instructional Innovation. We realized at the very beginning with the name of Instructional Technology, the focus was being put up more on the technology rather than the teaching and learning process. So with it becoming the Center for Instructional Innovation, that put the focus back on what the teacher was doing and what the student was doing. We also were able to develop best practices for digital learning environments and if you type in that uh, URL it'll take you to that document and the what we've learned is also being applied in our new initiative Engage Learning because we truly have learned through the iLearn program looking at these uh, iLearn classes the classes that did the best were the ones that were truly having their students engaged in the learning process students taking ownership of what they were learning and that's another impact that has been made through our program. This last slide brings you some information about me, how to contact me, so if you have any questions about what's going on in your system and you want to dialogue a little bit with me, you can either call me on my Google Voice number at 731-879-1119 uh, you can email me at mtatum at fhu.edu. Uh, our Fried Hardeman email is basically a Google mail, so I can also do a Google chat with you or a Google hangout with you. Whatever I can do to assist you in, in your system's process of truly bringing the focus on pedagogy with technology, I'm more than willing to do that.